Well, today we will we will say goodbye to Abraham on his earthly journey and get into Jacob and Esau. So Isaac's family is starting to grow. Um, it does start out with some names. So I'm a little bummed. Margaret isn't here. Uh, but uh, anyone want to take that? Or? I will I will gladly read it and stumble. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll take I'll take the first uh, eleven verses there. Abraham took another wife, whose name was Keturah. She bore him Zimran, Jokashan, Median, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan was the father of Sheba and Dedan. And descendants of Dedan were the Asherites, the Letushites, and the Luminites. The sons of Midian were Ephah, Ephor, Hanosh, Abedah, and Eldah. All these were descendants of Keturah. Abraham left everything he owned to Isaac, but while he was still living, he gave gifts to the sons of his concubines and sent them away from his son Isaac to the land of the east. Altogether, Abraham lived 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age, an old man and full of years, and he was gathered to his people. His sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah near Mamre, in the field of Ephron, son of Zahor, the Hittite, the field Abraham had bought from the Hittites. There Abraham was buried with his wife Sarah. After Abraham's death, God blessed his son Isaac, who then lived near Ber Lahoi Loi. This is the account of Abraham's son Ishmael, son of Sarah's maidservant Hagar, the first no, I'm sorry, the Egyptian born to Abraham. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael, listed in the order of their birth. Well, here we go. <laughs> Nebahoth, Nebahoth, the firstborn of Ishmael, Kedar, Advel, Mibsam, Mishma, Derma, Masa, Hadad, Tima, Detur, Nephish, and Kedema. These were the sons of Ishmael. And these are the names of the twelve tribes, rulers, according to their settlements and camps. Altogether, Ishmael lived 137 years. He breathed his last and died, and he was gathered to his people. His descendants settled in the area from Havilah to Shur, near the border of Egypt, as you go toward Asher. And they lived in hostility towards all their brothers. This is the account of Abraham's son Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Armenian from Pada Aram, and sister of Laban, the Armenian. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to acquire the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the younger will serve the older. I'm sorry, the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country. While Jacob was a quiet man, stayed among the tents, Isaac, who had a taste for a wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, Quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he was also called Edom. 
Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. When Jacob saw Esau, gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew, he ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Great. So, we, in the look section there, note that Midian, Midian is, is the only son of Keturah who is mentioned further in the Old Testament. His clan was always an enemy of God's people. So, um, anybody re recall where in the Bible, oh, it's mentioned two Two times, really, specifically, where Midian, the son of Keturah, is mentioned. Just came out of Christmas, that's a hint. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 4 and 5. If you uh, flip over to Isaiah chapter 9, prophecy there. Was a child is born? Yeah. Eight and nine. Or chapter nine of Isaiah, verses four and five. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulder, the rod of their oppressor, every warrior's boot used in battle, and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, for to us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And that's referring back to the battle recorded in Judges chapter 7. Um, so that's where Gideon has just a few hundred men, and the camp of Midian is in the valley. They light some torches, and they bang some, and break some pots in the middle of the night. Midian's troops all get out of their tents, and they're they're confused and they, they fight each other because they think they think they're being stormed by an enemy, but they're just actually being stormed by their, their neighbors coming out of their tents. Um, yeah, it's one of those victories God gave that you know defied all 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 odds. Um, so yeah, we we read that we read that text and um, I don't know. I always feel like it's probably confusing to people like. What are, you, what are you talking about on Christmas? Rolling garments <laughs> up that are bloody and burning them up. Um, but that's, of course, that's what you did after the war. After you were victorious, you didn't take your your clothes to the cleaners. You you burned them. You know, well, you didn't you didn't need your war clothes anymore. It's, that's what the prophecy is saying, right? You, now now the war is over. The Prince of Peace has come. The battle has ended. So. So it becomes, a, it becomes a metaphor for what Christ would do. Um, so the great, the great victory that would be accomplished. And of course, it's always poetic when you think about it that, you know, we have a baby saving, saving the world here, uh, the Messiah. And uh, God, God likes to, to save his people in unlikely fashion, unexpected ways. Um, yeah. So anyway, so that's that's the that's Midian. The other the other individuals, you know, they were a pain in the butt, but they didn't they didn't get mentioned again. So <laughs> kind of long and short of it, right? Um, didn't sound like they got along with anybody. Uh, the accounts, yeah. So this is the, the chapter contains the seventh and tenth accounts of Ishmael, and begins the eighth. Of, of Isaac, so so Genesis is kind of a, a checklist. We're, we're checking off the the, the generations here and the, the, the story of, of what happened in their time um, as it pertains, particularly to the promise of of the Messiah and and the nation to come that God had given Abraham. Now, I know you had a hand up. I 
Yes, I have a note that all the sons of Keturah uh, became tribes in the southern part of Arabia and became enemies of Israel. Yeah. <coughs> yep. So... One of those things where I think we have a soft spot in our heart for Keturah, but but her, her kids, you know, didn't turn out so good. Um, anybody know a girl named Keturah? I went to school with Keturah. There was a Keturah in Survivor. Was oh, there? Yeah. Yeah. De de definitely a biblical name. Definitely a Christian name, probably. Maybe a Jewish name. Yeah. Okay. Um. Questions. Why did Abraham make a distinction between Isaac and his other sons? Um, and I, I guess it does, it's assuming you understand the distinction. What's, so what's the distinction, and why did he do it? Well, John? I have a question. Oh, sure. um, it says that he gave gifts to the sons of his concubines, which means... What exactly is a concubine, and how, you know, that means that there were other sons too. It does. Yeah. And Bill, Bill, you know, it's got a wife. Susan. Would he need a concubine? In the People's Bible, they make reference to this as in this chapter he does refer to her as his wife, but later in the chapter he refers to her as a concubine, and. There really isn't that much of a difference because this wasn't this wasn't the line that the Savior was to come. So therefore, it, there wasn't the importance that Sarah was. Yeah, I mean, you got you kind of got the spectrum. You got your wife, you got your concubines, and you have kind of like your harem category, right? And um, it doesn't appear that he was he was the kind of type of wealthy individual that had a harem. Um, you know, there's 50 girls, and I'm I'm looking for the one that's you know not menstruating this this day type of thing. It's not like that. It is more like his his concubine, um, another wife is this category more so. Um, yeah, I don't think anybody should feel comfortable with that or, or prove that. That's not God's plan. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll kind of we'll kind of come back come back to that. I don't know if it's this, this lesson or next a little bit. Um, yeah, I think next lesson wants to talk a little bit about that in the question. But yeah, so he does get he does have other other women besides Keturah that he's having children with. Uh, whether they're considered equal to Keturah. As 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 some um, sister wives, I don't know maybe the <laughs> the terminology the back then, but or or how many there were, were I don't believe we're exactly told. I, I think when we get to uh, Solomon, we're told about his harem. Was it his harem in the hundreds, maybe? Okay, um, what was Isaac's mother? <coughs> so Is she Rebecca, Isaac's mother. So Abraham, Isaac's mother is Sarah. 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 Sarah, that's what I thought, yeah. and Rebecca yeah. is his wife. Okay. Rebecca, yeah. And they did love each other, but the, the, this concubine thing—it was a period of time when this took place that the sons of the concubines didn't get property; they didn't get an inheritance. And here he does give them all some inheritance to leave. Yeah, it said he gave him, uh, gave all of them something. Yes. Yeah, something right. really struck me. I knew he was wealthy, but I'm thinking for all this entourage that he has and Hager, God, or groupies, whatever, he provides for them while he was still living and sends them away. So yeah. he was really, really wealthy and not much of a father. <laughs> I, keep, I keep thinking, why would they? he raise children who are so against him and... and yeah, but don't you think they were taken away? Don't you think that he really he didn't spend no, a lot of time? time, was time, time, time. We, we kind of have a we kind of have like an Elon Musk type of family situation, yeah. right? <laughs> okay. 
happy. And he's a really wealthy guy. And, and, and I don't know. I don't I don't read anything in the papers that chastise. I mean, maybe I'm not reading like a Christian newspaper per se. or, But, I mean, pretty, I mean, do you know how many children Elon Musk has? <laughs> I, I have no idea. I think he's got more than seven or eight or so. And I don't know how many mothers, you know. And, I mean... Nobody, nobody touches it. It's like kind of, it's kind of interesting, right? I mean, he's he's got uh, quite the hair on himself. But uh, I, I think I, I think we do have it mentioned that he took care of them. I mean, this is unexpected that he gave them gave them a, a gift. Um, yeah. So, but he does make the distinction that Isaac Isaac is the one that's going to be carrying on the promise, right? Um, so, and how does he do that? He, he gave him everything, right? Uh, how, how, everything he didn't already, maybe, yeah, what verse is that? Um, yeah, sorry, Abraham left everything he owed, he owed to Isaac. And, and so, you know, what was the custom of the day or tradition? It would have been that the oldest would have gotten like a double portion of, of everybody else. So, um, you know, just just do the math. If you had 100 kids, Isaac would get 2% and everybody else would get 1%, right? Um, he would get double, but it, that's not what he does. He gives everything to, to them. So... Again, I, I guess maybe not to be caught up in the the details of the, the estate here, but he does he does make it pretty clear that Isaac is <laughs> is the one that's going to be blessed with the promise of of the, the line. So, and um, the editor, in my notes, makes a point that you know nobody could challenge that. Um, you know, Abraham Abraham had a good line of succession. Um, and you know that if you have a good a good will, you, you save your family a lot of problems. And uh, he had a good he had a good will. So, but yeah, we'll we'll, we'll continue to talk, we'll come back to the concubine. I mean, we are it, it is it is a struggle to to say well this is this is the the hero of faith and yeah how many kids did he have? Um, so, what, what was it? I what was it? The uh, I, I love the story of the the missionary that went down to 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 Antigua and uh, brought brought some brought some kids kids up to the seminary and. Um, they, they, they were shocked that the, the seminary students had beer in the refrigerator. Like, what? They're all drinking up here? <laughs> like, how can they become pastors if they're drinking? And uh, then, yeah, they, they, no, I forget what uh, the other half of that was. Then I think some of the seminary students go down to Antigua and they're like, I don't know if they were they were cussing like sailors or what it was, but they were just like, what, what what's going on down here? <laughs> like, like how can they behave this way and be Christians, you know? And uh, I, I think definitely over three thousand years we, uh, from Abraham, there's there's cultural differences. I mean, I, I wonder what he would see us doing. He'd be like, what? Um, he's like, none of my concubines had an abortion. What are you guys doing? Um, how could you murder somebody? Um, let's say we're doing that, but you get the point, right? Um, so, um, okay, enough about that until we talk about it again. <laughs> Question two. Uh, Sarah had, had been barren, and how Rebecca was, and now Rebecca was barren. How did God use this? For the spiritual good of the patriarchs and their families. God, God loves to to make family promises to barren people. <laughs> almost, 
almost seems a little cruel. Susan? It keeps them closer to God because they pray more. Yeah. They, they definitely they definitely need to rely on the Lord more in their, their weaknesses. Paul said it really well, you know, my, your strength is made perfect in my, my weakness. And, and would, it, would it have been the would it have been this would these promises have carried the weight and and uh, you know just the weight if these if these wives are just very fertile yeah probably but it's different. God's right in His timing it wasn't in His timing for her to have a child when she was younger it was in His timing that she had it later and so the plan was there the promise was there they just didn't have to believe. I don't think they do that anymore with driver's ed, but I mean, I've heard stories where the, the car would have on the driver's ed teacher's side the, the brake. The yeah. I, mean, I don't think they ever put the gas pedal over there, did they? <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe Lyle could, could straighten me out sometime. But yeah, they always put the brake over there. And God, God tends to be that guy that's you know guiding, guiding Abraham and his family, and he'll hit the brakes when he wants to. Um, didn't, didn't maybe hit the brakes on some concubines, but he'll, he'll put some brakes on other places. Um, yeah. Question? I think, I think he was testing, testing their faith if they really believed in him. I think that's what God was doing. Yeah. There's a there, there's a saying that when when your body when your body is exhausted. You've only reached forty percent of your body's potential. Really? Um, I don't know how scientific that is, but it's probably pretty true. Like when you think, when you think, well, I, I can't go any further. I'm tired. Um, you probably still got sixty percent to go. You just mentally have to get there and push yourself. Um, and I think spiritually, the same thing happens. I think you know. I'm, 40%. We're probably all crying uncle, saying, Lord, wait, what are you doing? I, I can't handle this. Um, you know, you made this promise. You're not keeping it. You know, and, and God says, oh, well, let's, let's just go another 10 years. Uh, you're, still, you're still managing. Um, you'll be fine. I know it's best for you. So, yeah. yeah. We might not have any personal, physical trainers in our lives, uh, but we do have a spiritual trainer, don't we? Yeah, so uh, how did God use this for the spiritual good of the patriarchs and their families, right? They, I, I, I just noted, too, that they certainly gave God the glory when the births happened. Uh, and they, they were over the, over the moon that, when the babies were born. I I had, a, I, had a, I had a good friend that was uh, in the medical field, and one of the things he told me, and he, and he didn't look at things from a, a biblical perspective, one of the things he told me about children, it was, he was like, I'm just amazed that people even get pregnant and have kids. You know, like, something, it's something we take for granted, but like, when you, when you get down to the A has to happen, and then B, and then C, and then D, and then E, and, and then there's nine months of all that that has to happen just, you know, perfectly. Uh, it's, it's truly mind-boggling, uh, the gift of, of life and birth. Um, so, I, I think I think so, so often we get focused and people get focused on the evolution that's visible, or what they think is evolution that's visible. But, I mean, there's true miracles just in the womb of... Of creation and, and life that only God could do. So, John, question? Well, I think it, um, waiting the 20 years like that gave Isaac and Rebecca a chance to really have a nice, good relationship because I noticed Isaac didn't take on concubines, at least not that I read of. And yeah. He was, and, he, and it talks about he and Rebecca playing together and stuff, you know, like they really enjoyed each other. You do get that vibe that maybe Isaac is like, I don't, I don't really want to be my dad in that regard. 
right? Even though when I have all the same kind of wealth and and, and blessings, yeah. Um, he is going to be like his dad in another way pretty soon. Question, okay, uh, three. Describe the struggle between Jacob and Esau. In their mother's womb to begin with. Well, they were certainly active in the womb. It sounded like they were either arguing or buying the space. They were, they were kickers. Yeah, they're fighting in the womb. Must must have been must have been more than just feel my belly and there's a little kick there. It must have been quite discomforting. Quite, yeah. Uh, Imagine Miami? having all that. Um, in the twins. Bible, it says they jostled each other, and I have a note that jostled is from a Hebrew verb that means to crush or oppress. So they were, they were. Yeah, when we think of jostling, maybe we think of, uh, I don't know, maybe more playfully, a context. But this is more of a, no, they were. They were really at each other, <laughs> um, and and then you mentioned that they, she didn't know, right? So, yeah, and of course, how 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 would you know? And I, yeah, my mother didn't know. Yeah, until she had us. So surprise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so here we here we got the first ultrasound, right? God is God isn't uh, maybe showing her the screen but telling her the results. Yeah, you have twins. Yeah, that's what's happening here. And yes, Denise. <clears throat> that's kind of funny because when I hear jostling, I think of Black Friday and the people you know stampeding and, yeah. and jostling for space trying to get the best getting crushed to the end stuff so yeah and you're like <laughs> and, and see my mental image on that was like on the basketball court when they're jostling for space to get the rebounds and those, yeah. guys are those all bodies are all and maneuvering well and then at the time of delivery um you know could just could you do that thought you know he's <clears throat> He's, he's grasping the heel of his brother. Um, so, you know, I guess the classic, we had to, we had to maneuver them in, in birth so that they, one could get out. They were both trying to come out at the same time. And, yeah. So, and it symbolizes the... The struggle for the birthright, um, or foreshadows it, really. Yes, sure. How can we look at this without seeing that God is behind all this, really? See, kind of like what he ordained, the very kind of thing we're going to see. Yeah, right here. I mean, what is God's yeah, involvement in, in this jostling of position? Because he makes, well, like he said, the ultrasound, he makes the predictions. He's hearing it. He's hearing it. Well, I don't want. I don't want to say God, and I don't think you're saying this, but I mean, did did God impute them with, with with hostility? I mean, I don't want to make God the author of, of their their sinfulness, but does God, does is is the is the Lord saying, hey, their sinful nature is on display, and guess what? That's just showing you what's going to happen, right? It's a, so, um, yeah. So they're destined. They're destined to struggle with each other. Yeah. Susan? I just find it ironic that that Esau is first, and yet he's described as the stronger, and yet he is going to be subject to his brother. I mean, it's like God reversed everything. Yeah, you know, that's. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> um, I was thinking in terms of the Esau um, was actually the one that was supposed to get the birthright and didn't. Right. And right. and so the promise did not occur by that was his right and so that's why he got it. 
the promise is actually a picture of grace. Right. That would, yeah, in, in Romans chapter 9, maybe that's where you're, you're referring or thinking about it. In Romans 9, 10 to 14, it's, you know, grace and mercy is, is this is used as the example, like God was gracious to Jacob. Uh, it wasn't because he was the firstborn, you know. God is gracious to us, not because of something we've done. Um, so, yeah, it becomes a metaphor for how God chooses the unlikely and, and has mercy on who he wants to have mercy upon. Um, but, yeah, you, you do have this juxtaposition of, you know, he's the strong one. He's the firstborn. He's, a, he's just a natural-born leader. And Jacob, you know, he's cooking stew with his mom. You know, <laughs> nobody sees him out hunting. You know, he's hasn't lifted lifted anything in his life per se. Like his brother is running around like Tarzan or you know Hercules. Um, but God wants him to be the leader. And uh, of course, Jacob is. You know, Esau is going to struggle with that. It's, but. He despises his birthright, doesn't he? And we, 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 he even though uh, he was, he knew that he would have, he was born with it. He, he didn't want it, and uh, so that, so that that comes out with with the stew um, and selling his birthright. Um, so once Esau, when once when Esau came in hungry from hunting, um, you know. Jacob, Jacob took advantage of that. Um, so, I think you can spin this two ways, and I'll, 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 I'll say this is how the editor uh, of our, our questions took it. The, the editor takes it in this way, and I, I probably should too. Jacob sees his brother as kind of a, a worldly, unbelieving man, and wants to get this blessing away from him. Um, so, this, so, I don't know, I think when you first read it, it sounds like Jacob is a conniver with his, his mom, you know, and, and we're just playing favorites, you know. You should get that blessing away from your brother. It's a really important thing. Um, but when you factor in the, that his brother is despising it, not caring about it, um, you know, there's like, there's no pushback. Well, this is mine from the Lord or from Dad. Um, when, there's, when there's no love of that, then it's then it's probably a good thing that Jacob said, "Give it to me." You know. Um, so, so if we have a Cain and Abel situation where where they both seem to be going through the motions of being God's people, but really Esau wasn't, then that that makes a lot of sense that. You know, God God was pleased, or we'll say blessed, the, the, the stew transaction, um, right? Because you don't, you don't read that, you know, God came to Jacob and said, you shouldn't have gotten it this way. It, you know, and you don't want to make an argument from silence. You know, just because God doesn't talk about it doesn't mean he was okay with it. Just like we wouldn't do that with polygamy, right? Just because just God didn't correct it doesn't mean he was okay with it. With Abraham, but the same goes here, though. I mean, you might think that way, um, and, and the New Testament certainly takes it that way. It's by grace that Jacob got the blessing, and it wasn't like God intervened and said, "No, this is a bad transaction, and we're going to reverse it." Um, so, I, I, I think for myself, yeah, I, I think it's easy to see that maybe a conniving mom and son here, uh, but. On the other hand, to see, no, maybe maybe he was kind of protecting. He was acting in faith for the, the promise. So, Susan? In verse 23, the Lord tells her this promise. <coughs> so therefore, she should never have been a part of this scheme, knowing that God already gave her that promise before they were born. So it wasn't their conniving that made this come about. The promise was already given. Well, well, two, well, two things on that. I mean, do, does she know that? Does she see this as the promise is going to be transferred when the 
when the younger, this older will serve the younger. Maybe she does. Um, I, I guess where I get, I, 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 I throw a little flag and want to have a, a, a ref's huddle is, is that we don't have Abraham involved in this decision, right? It's like, like we have the two boys and, and mom wants this to happen, but Abraham is, is not. And, um, again, I guess Abraham is, um, He's involved in, later, yeah. and because he he knows he he thinks he has to give it to Esau as the firstborn. So what did he forget the promise? Yeah, I I think it was like he had a momentary lapse of judgment. Or am I? Um, or should I say he's he's passed away already? So maybe so maybe, no, okay. Before he died, he had to um, pass on a birthright, and the birthright was what. Exactly. That was the promise that there was going to be a Messiah through this line. Right. That's the birthright you're talking about. Yeah. So, even though my, even though my flesh is not exactly excited about this happening when one of them is distressed and hungry, uh, and the other one is kind of like holding back food. Um, it, 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 I, I will say I am content with the fact that Jacob is the man of God that, that God wants to have this blessing, right? And, and, and it is foretold, um, but again, how, how many years or how this prophecy was understood, maybe it was understood later by, by Rebecca. I mean that that can happen too, right? We can have we have prophecies that are put aside, and then oh yeah, that's what God told me when they were born. Um, you, gotta, you gotta do that with Jesus a little bit, you know. You have these you have these these Mary prophecies. You're, you know, your son is your son is gonna you know be the rise the cause of rising and falling of nations, and then then they go to the temple twelve years later, and she forgets that's where he was gonna be. Like so. So, yeah, how much, I mean, for us, it's only, you know, 60, 60 words away, the promise and the fulfillment. But for them, it was years. Did they remember that? Were they trying to, to see it happen? I, I don't know, always, always. Um, John, At what's your thought? At this point, though, uh, Rebecca wasn't necessarily involved in this. It was between Jacob and Esau. It doesn't say anywhere about Rebecca saying, hey, Jacob, do this. The, the hey Jacob do this came oh, later when um, it came later when Isaac needed <coughs> right so Isaac's gonna yeah Isaac's gonna yeah trick his dad um, that came later but in this instance I don't think she was necessarily involved I think that was Jacob's own cutting well, well we do we do have the favored son thing right um, yeah, so kind of implies it a little, but at, at the end of the day, she wasn't going to be upset about it. I'll, we can at least probably say that. She right. Like, Esau's the your dad's son who's not not well behaved, and yeah, you know, and maybe maybe she even sees his faith as non-existent. Um, um, so, all right, apply. How, how would you have felt at Abraham's funeral? What thoughts might you have had? How do you feel? Sorry, I, I did not relate to that question. I, it was like the interviewer sticking the microphone and some disaster has happened. Well, how do you feel about it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I thought it depended on which group you belong to. Were you someone from the concubines group or were you from, you know, uh, depends on who you are at that funeral. Naomi? How great is the love the Lord has lavished on us 
that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. That's what I would have thought. Yeah, I I mean could could we say all funerals have this general feeling? Um, you know, God's blessed this person in many ways. They, they have been sinful in many ways. Uh, you know, I'm not going to bring those things up today at the funeral. Uh, but maybe all of us know most of the big things they've done that were, were wrong. Uh, but, but in the end, God, God was good to them and and they, they lived they lived a life of faith. Um, and you know, God he took he took you you know, what do you, what do you talk about at this funeral? You talk about him ready to sacrifice his son, right? Because that's what God asked him to do. Or how he left his homeland because that's what God asked him and told him to do. Um, talk about how he patiently waited for for him. For his son to be born when he was a hundred, um, yeah. I went to over over break. I went to this little museum and it had uh, a, a bedroom that Abraham Lincoln stayed at one night, and they had the bed still there and the room still decorated that he stayed in, and uh, and uh, you know you go out through all Illinois and you know this is your this is the, the toilet Abraham Lincoln used, and this is the gavel he used, and these were his slippers, and, um, you know, a lot of us could probably find five or ten things that's nice to say about Abraham Lincoln. But did, did you know he was in a duel? Almost. Like, like literally, he was, he was challenged. Somebody challenged him to a duel, and he accepted it. And he went to Missouri, where dueling was legal. And because he was challenged, he could choose the weapon. And they had, they had uh, pistols, and they had swords. And, and Abraham Lincoln thought, well, since I'm like a head taller than this guy, I'll pick the sword, right? So he gets the sword, and, you know, and, and he brandishes it. You know, he has his long arms, and this other guy doesn't stand a chance against a you know, whatever, seven foot tall guy with a sword. Um, and why was he challenged to a duel? Because he was, he and his, his wife too, maybe she did more than him. They were publishing these, these uh, Dear Abby, John, fake letters in newspapers talking about this other guy. We can't, I can't feed, this fictitious farmer was writing in saying, I can't feed my family and, and this politician's at fault, and they're gonna have to sell the farm, and you know, uh, I I wouldn't let him marry my goats, and, and it was just it was just really not nice things that Abraham Lincoln and his wife wrote about this man. Um, and so when he found out that it was Abraham Lincoln, challenged him to a duel, he accepted. They go down there, and then what does Abraham Lincoln do? He basically says, most of the nasty stuff is what my wife wrote. <laughs> <laughs> And they, they got along, and later, later when Lincoln became president, he appointed him in his cabinet, um, and they never, but thank God, Lincoln didn't choose pistols. Right? Um, and he, when he was asked about it later, he said, that's a regrettable thing we'll never talk about again. You know, like he, he would he acknowledged it, but he said he was never gonna talk about it. You know, and there's other stories, you know, when 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 things got tough in the tough in the in the Congress in, in Illinois, he and a bunch of other guys jumped out the window and left. They ran to another state because they didn't want to vote. I mean, you could do that with everybody, right? You you could you could cherry pick <laughs> not great moments in their life, but at the end of the day, their funeral, you're like Abraham Lincoln was one of the greatest presidents. Even if even if he acted like he was in the in the backyard of the school and he wrote nasty letters, um, he matured from it, um, and God God used him in, in, in special ways. So I don't know. You, you got to get the same I, kind of the same things here a little bit. Um, 
Pastor Abraham but, yeah. Lincoln was not a very good father either. His no. kids were just notoriously tore up the place, and no. he, did, he just let them do it. <laughs> yeah. I, so, not, not, not to say, I, I think we understand, you know, great, you know, the, the great hero of faith he was and, and how he followed the Lord. Um, and and it's God, God kind of looked the other way with, with Abraham because he's Abraham. I, I think that's a fair thing to say. I think sometimes God looked the other way because Abraham was Abraham. Um, but, gosh, even... God even thought so highly of him that even in his even in his screw ups he was blessed, right? Like even when <laughs> even even when he should have been kicked out of uh, of town with with just the clothes on his back, you know, um, was it uh, oh, I'm blanking on his name? Was it Benadab or no? Abimelech says, "Here, take a bunch of stuff with you." So even when, even when he screwed up majorly, he seemed he always came out roses. Um, but that was God's grace. And, uh, sure. I just think there's something else to observe here. It's all the good things about Abraham, but who was there at his funeral? Both the sons. Could have just been Isaac. But Ishmael, we don't know how many years, you know, because Abraham had sent Ishmael young and his mother away. We don't know over the period of years there would have been any contact or anything, but somehow Ishmael got worried that dad died. He was there because Ishmael was blessed by God too, and I think that's important because I'm reminded of when my both, Jim died, the one son who at least had some relation, of course, was there with his family, but a son who had nothing to do with his father for years did turn up. Yeah, that that is a really touching moment there. Comment, you know, they both buried their father. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how does the story of Jacob and Esau repeat itself over and over again? <laughs> Didn't connect with this question either. Oh, that one I did. Oh, okay. <laughs> that one that one kind of made sense. But we haven't really talked as much about the fact that Esau was so willing to give up his birthright. <gasps> I'm famished. I'm di very dramatic. I'm just dying here. And and Jacob was willing to jump right in and say, fine, sell me your birthright. And the birthright, again, was I will be in the lineage of the Messiah. I will be the one that also um, deals with the uh, worship and all of those things that went with the birthright. And Esau just threw it all away, literally. Yeah. That meant so little to him. And then I was thinking that, well, we have the same thing with, like, say, our baptism. It means so little to us that we don't daily think about our baptism. We just mosey on along through life and forget the benefit that we have received and take advantage of that. And, and prayer and the Holy Spirit and so many things. That was my point. Yeah. Yes. Such an action or sin is irrational. Like, why would he do that? But, yeah. The sin here is we always think we have to help God along. We know what God's will is today. They knew what God's promise was, but it wasn't happening like they thought it should be, so they had to kick in and, and make it happen. And it always goes bad. When you try to intervene with what God wants for you, like it's just time and time again. Yeah. God, God definitely didn't come in a vision and say, hey, when your brother comes in hungry, get that birthright, by the way. <laughs> you know, but even in, even in our blunders, God works it out to his glory. Right? Um, what was a birthright? I mean, it wasn't a piece of paper. Like, we have I mean, it's it's really this the the default default inheritance that everybody is expected to give. I mean, we're instead of, so instead of going to a lawyer and you know giving ten percent of your 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 estate to a charity, I mean, you just assumed 
So it always was the first. The firstborn gets gets whatever first material male, blessings. The firstborn but male, because they will include female. First, firstborn male, correct? Yeah, you could have eleven girls and then one boy, and then boom, that boy is he gets double. Um, so yeah, so it's firstborn male. It's just this, this assumed line of of the family, and um, so. My, I'll just kick back to the editor here. So he writes, Those who by God's grace treasure the promise are always struggling with those who don't treasure with treasure it. Um, so, so continuing along the lines of uh, thinking, you know, maybe, maybe you know, Esau doesn't, doesn't cherish this, and, and J Jacob is frustrated by that. And you know, do, and maybe do we kind of do the same thing? We we see someone that didn't go to church on Christmas and think Jesus came for you, and you don't you don't treasure that. Um, <coughs> you know, there's always maybe a, a, a conflict between um, priorities of, of those who have faith and those who don't. Um, that's that was one application I guess the editor was making. Um, I, I I think it's. We see it over and over again that even, even in our maybe not so great moments, God, God, I don't know, I want to say accepts it, but God works through that and with it, right? Um, he know He knows that simple human beings uh, are going to keep getting blessed despite their sin, and that's certainly a that's certainly a theme for us that we see over and over again. Um, Time is come. Any last comments or questions? Next week we will talk about Isaac some more in chapter 26. Abimelech returns. Probably not the Abimelech his dad dealt with, but, but a different, probably the son of Abimelech. So the second generations will have their feelings. Let's close with a prayer. Dear, dear Lord, we know that Abraham is in heaven at your side, and, and certainly it is by, by so much grace that, that you blessed him with, with great faith and in, in certainly moments to to admire that faith and to find strength. Uh, certainly, Lord, we, we find ourselves like Abraham being blessed, uh, even, when, even when we're not at our greatest. Uh, and, and we thank you for that, that abundant, abundant grace as well. Uh, bless, bless the rest of this day and, and make, make it a, a pleasing in your, may it be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <coughs> Praise God from all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him all the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.